Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about, does PTSD cause brain damage? Well, that's also a loaded question. Most of them are. PTSD may cause brain damage over time. The interesting thing about PTSD is that um, it's very healable for most people. However, if the exposure is drastic and long, a person can end up with brain damage that looks like the same as concussion. Some of the brain damage that happens in, in concussion or traumatic brain injury or PTSD takes place over time, and it takes place with repeated traumas. So if a person has repeated childhood traumas or repeated wartime experiences that are traumatic or other abuses or crimes committed to them, they have repeated, repeated impacts, repeated blows, repeated offenses, and that can cause repeated injury to the brain. The strange thing about PTSD is it's an emotional injury. It's, a, it's an experiential injury where a person witnesses, sees, participates in, uh, hears, feels, listens to, smells the events of life. There's not an impact to the brain physically or chemically. There is an impact to the brain emotionally. And there is an impact chemically later because it isn't quite instantaneous. Certainly there's a blast of cortisol and a blast of epinephrine. These are, these are stress hormones, but the real effects for more permanence of PTSD is when a person has it for longer and when they don't resolve it and when it's multiple repetitions. When it's multiple repetitions, that's when people start to really go downhill. Most of the time though, I wanna be very hopeful, PTSD is quite treatable. If PTSD is child-based or if PTSD is adult-based. Now, as a child, it's often based on a traumatic event or repeated events and those are healable with various psychological methods and neurofeedback and dietary interventions and brain exercises. And um, the, uh, the adult onset ones are even easier to heal because the adult onset ones are usually related to a single event. Like for example, in the Oklahoma City bombing, there were a number of therapists that were able to go in and do EMDR therapy and help people with PTSD right away. And, and usually PTSD manifests later after, the, the official diagnosis manifests later after an event. It has to be lasting types of problems to qualify as a diagnosis of PTSD or of um, traumatic brain injury or mild traumatic brain injury. So a person has to have persistent symptoms and the symptoms are things like recurrent flashbacks where they get triggered by some kind of event. Something happens to them and it triggers a memory and the memory starts to play or loop in their head and that can happen when they're out in life triggered by an event. It can also happen spontaneously when they are sleeping or trying to go to sleep or just plain bored or idle. If they're not supremely busy, sometimes their mind can wander and without a trigger, they can start replaying memories and having fears and having bad memories replayed. They can feel depressed, they can feel anxious, they can feel withdrawn, they can have digestive disturbances and immune disturbances. All types of things can happen to their bodies because the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain, also has a lot to do with controlling the endocrine system and the immune system. So we know that the limbic system and the cerebellum both are controlling and involved in regulating the, um, um, the right and left side are involved in regulating the upregulation and downregulation of the immune system and the endocrine system, which is little known. It isn't talked about very much. But the idea that the left and right side are differential in how they control can be a problem. So it's very useful to get some kind of QEG to analyze, is there a, a sidedness? Is there an, um, a bias toward one side or the other? Is the injury more on the left side or the right side or the front or the back of the limbic system, which is to say the anterior cingulate cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex. Those are the parts of the brain where if you took the hemispheres, which look like this, and you split them apart and you looked right in here, you would see this lower part of this flat wall of the hemisphere is the anterior, middle, and posterior cingulate on each side. And so that is the area that we look at when we try to figure out what's, what's gone wrong with a lot of these emotional problems. Now it isn't the only area, certainly the temporal lobes can be involved, and that can be the temporal portions called the hippocampus, which approach the amygdala. And that can be responsible for memory and recurrent memory and memories that just, just plague you and, and can't be calmed down. And also the amygdala has to do with, with the identification and recall of faces, and also the deep drives, the, the very, very deep drives like um, massive hunger, massive uh, violence, those types of things are driven by the amygdala. 
massive sexual responses are driven in humans and animals by the amygdala. And of course, a fear response. So those are the, those are the four things. Rage and fight, flight and running away, sexual behavior and eating behavior. Those are the four drives. They're not quite emotions. They're very primitive drives. And all animals that have an amygdala have them. So those are also areas that can, can be a problem. And there can be imbalances between the right and left amygdala, as well as the right and left hippocampus for memory. So we can look for those with things like QEG and neurological examinations, and we can rehabilitate them. So they're not hopeless. The toughest cases are people that would, would have had recurrent experiences of trauma in childhood, and again in adulthood, they were unrelenting, the person was malnourished, and maybe even has SNPs that are coding for problems with their metabolism. So if you add all that together, you get somebody who's really harder to treat than somebody else. So all of them can be addressed one by one, bit by bit, and piece by piece. You just have to analyze the SNPs, you have to do the nutrition and, and change the diet to address the chemistry. You have to give supplements that are anti-inflammatory to the brain, which we'll get to. You have to do the psychological treatment of counseling and group therapy and EMDR, and you have to do neurofeedback based on QEG and, uh, and good quality EEG data collection and sometimes ERP data collection, event-related potentials. And then you also have to make sure that you do a good neurological exam and neuro rehab because these patients often have basal ganglia and cerebellar components to their concussions or to their PTSD, which would give them movement problems and coordination problems that are not readily addressed by psychologists and psychotherapists and psychiatrists. So those can show up. So a person's PTSD may involve the old-fashioned shell shock that you've seen in videos from World War I and World War II where there's a movement disorder related and the person has these dramatic shakes. They, they can't walk, they can't balance, they take jerky steps, they have, um, they have uh, tremorous legs where they can try to take a step and their, their arms tremor and their legs tremor, their head tremors. These are um, what used to be called shell shock and this was a, a component of, of early PTSD and today it's a part of it too. So if you look at some of the soldiers that have advanced PTSD, they have movement disorders. They have problems with their basal ganglia and this needs to be addressed. Thank you.